Chalo, I could see underneath it says El Guapo. First of all, I want to tell you we missed you last week. And also, congratulations on your anniversary. Hopefully, you had a wonderful time. Felicidades, amigo. Oh, thank you, man. It was it was awesome. You know, it was one of those things that, you know, that my wife was working. And she says, hey, you know what? We can do our anniversary dinner some other day. And then she says, surprise, I left work early here. And I'm like, oh, okay. I knew she was up to something, you know, she, you know. Yeah. But we ended up having a great dinner, good conversation, bro. You know, it's it's it, a long time with the wife is always really good, bro. I, I really hey, and I had a great wife. anniversary. A happy wife, a happy life, brother. Right? Uh, yeah, bro. I mean, uh, it, that's that's the truth, the whole truth, but nothing but the truth. <laughs> Benny, how are you? How how are you feeling? I, I I a couple of days ago you weren't feeling well. Are you feeling much better now? Oh yeah, I'm back to hundred percent. I just had some COVID residual come back after about yeah. a year. Well, good, good. Thank God, Benny. Thank God that you're okay. Guys, first of all, I want to give a shout out to uh, JC. JC is one of our uh, loyal listeners on my show, Los Tres Chingones Boxing. He knows a lot about law enforcement. Thank you for being on the show. William Johnson, Ishmo 1208. Bienvenido, mi hermano, en Cristo. En bienvenido al show. And uh, as we go along, guys, uh, we're going to have a lot of people coming on the show. We Today, I'm telling you, it's going to be an outstanding show. I, I could go on and on to talk about our guests, but Benny, that's your job. But before we go on with the show, guys, we always have shout outs. And Chandler, we're going to start off with you. Go well, ahead. Well, you know, you, you know what, you know, David, it's one of those things, it's one of these bitter, bittersweet remembrance that we have today. Today's the 39th anniversary of that dreadful 1984 San Ysidro McDonald's shootout, uh, a shootout that lasted 77 minutes. Uh, a lot of people died. Um, you know, prayers to the family, the survivors, the families that still are there, and a lot of prayers to our officers, San Diego PD officers, people responding that you know went out there and 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 handled that situation. Probably like we we said in the past, probably was the first mass shooting you know incident that you know law enforcement actually uh, had during that time, and and there was no training uh, given at the time like there were in other times in 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 anywhere in the United States. Now, you know, we have all this training and even then, I mean, there's always room for improve, improvement. So my prayers, you know, my saludos, un fuerte abrazo to all the survivors out there and their families uh, and also to the people that perish, you know, may, may, may God have them in their glory. Uh, and that's that's my shout out for this for this a day. Amen. Prayers for them and their families, brother. We also want to give a shout out to 209er. Welcome to the show. Everlasting Bass, Lupe, Justin Cunningham, that prison guard. We're going to talk a little bit about you. Benny is right now. Donald, Donald Donaldo, Trump is uh, big. Jose, bienvenido. Welcome to the show, brothers. With that said, Benny, I know you got a couple of shout outs. It's all yours, brother. Here we go. Well, first, let's don't forget that we got Sean missing today. He's out on a mission. He's probably doing a really low crawl down the border <laughs> along the wall <laughs> looking for that tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> He's looking yeah, for the pickle cart. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. looking for that. He's looking for the golden uh, the golden nugget, I guess. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Sean. Well, my shout outs are to Hector Bravo, that prison guard, that podcast. I mean, you guys gotta get on that show and watch and listen to his uh, expertise. I mean, the guy's a great uh, speaker. He has a lot of stories, uh, all related to uh, CDC or the California Department of Corrections. Uh, just a great guy, man. You know, uh, I encourage you guys to jump on that uh, on that podcast, uh, the, the YouTube channel, and just watch some of these stories. I mean, they're just great. Yeah. Uh, my other shout out is to uh, people from the Valley. I mean, uh, Danny Garcia and Ariel Casillas of Hot Mike, Hot Mike podcast. They're still not on the air. Uh, we hope to see them on the air soon and and be able to chat with them and have fun. I mean, they're, they're a lot of fun, too. They're also uh, CDC employees, guards. Uh, and my last shout out is to uh, nothing other than Brian Perry. He's got his own podcast. It's called Untold Crime Stories. And he also has a recent book called Hit List. I mean, he has some really, really good stories. Mm -hmm. I mean, this guy is SSU. As, I mean, a man of experience, man. He's like a uh, like a Devin Hawks, man. You know, uh, you just really want to watch his show. I mean, those are good, good stories, man. I'm telling you, you just... Jump on this uh, podcast, Untold Crime Stories, that prison guard, and then Hot Mike, Hot Mike, when they come back on the air. Excellent. Yes, definitely. 
It says he is Caño. You've been following us for a while. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Luis, all the way from Pasadena. Thank you once again, brother, for being on our show. With that said, guys, I have two announcements. First of all, the International Latino Gang Investigator Association. This is for law enforcement and also for retired law enforcement. This is a conference that's going to be August the 7th through the 10th at uh, the Tropicana Hotel. There's going to be a lot of guest speakers this is an international convention, so you're going to have people from all over the world. I don't know if they're coming from Ukraine, but I definitely know that they're coming from Nicaragua, from Honduras, from Mexico, from Colombia, from different parts, like I said. Uh, Mexico, a lot of a lot of law enforcement is going to be at this conference. Uh, there's going to be a lot of great topics. So if you're law enforcement or retired, please your hotel for that at the Tropicana, I believe it's only like $89. So if you're uh, you have that time, go. You're, this is a great conference. A lot of great speakers are going to be there. And with that said, uh, my actually Benny Cruz, a gentleman by the name of Pete Bollinger, who's the CEO and president of Police Fire Publishing. He's also a retired detective sergeant with the Santa Ana Police Department. And myself wrote a book called When the Music Stops, the Pain Begins. And it's for those people, not only for police officers, it's for teachers, it's for ministers, it's for nurses, it's for firefighters, it's for correctional officers, it's for that gang member, because we actually cover gang members, we actually even cover a chapter on boxers, that when they retire or during their job, during their performance, many of us including myself and Benny and Pete and a lot of us in law enforcement suffer from PTSD. This is a book. It's going to be coming out. We were scheduled to, uh, to uh, it was scheduled to come out uh, the first week of August, but now it looks like it might be in September. But this is that book that you are going to pick up. And I guarantee you, you're going to pick it up and you're not going to put it down until you've read it. This is a, a book where we share many intimate moments, many intimate uh, uh, incidents that we experience as police officers that, believe it or not, not even my wife or Benny's wife or kids know about it because we never talk about it. But the reason why we put it in writing is to help you, to help other people suffering, including ourselves. This is part of our healing, suffering from PTSD. And it's about suicides. It's a great book. But guys, the show it is about the book, about me, this show today. It's going to be an excellent show. With that said, Benny, it's all yours, brother. Listos. Here we go. Well, today we have uh, Steve Duncan. I mean, you know, everybody's been asking for Steve for, for quite a while. I mean, you know, and, and for those that don't know who Steve is, Steve Duncan is a retired special agent of the California Department of Justice in California. Again, he spent 20 years with Cal DOJ. That's what we call it, Cal DOJ in, our, in the police world. He retired in December of 2016. Before Cal DOJ, Steve was a probation officer in the county of San Diego for 12 years. He was the first probation officer in San Diego history to work on a DEA task force. Now that's very special. You don't get on a task force that easy, especially DEA. Uh, Steve was assigned as a task force officer. We call them TFOs. From 1992 to 2011, Steve's assignments included the Ariano Felix Task Force, the Violent Crimes Task Force Gang Group, and the Cross Violence, or it's actually called Cross Border Violence Task Force, I believe. I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. Uh, it has federal, state, and local law enforcement officers, along with military agencies, all working together. It's a task force. Uh, Steve has participated in numerous documentaries, podcasts, radio interviews, books, and the press on gangs and cartels talking about them, explaining to the public the impact they cost on our society. Uh, he has appeared on Gangland, National Geographic Tijuana Drug Lords, and the National Geographic Narco Wars. So, I mean, Steve's a great guy, man. Welcome to the show, Steve. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you all. So, Steve, I'm going to ask you a first question. Can you please share with us briefly your law enforcement background? Yes, in, in 1984, uh, 1984, I started as a probation officer with the County of San Diego, and I was assigned to Juvenile Hall, um, supervising kids that were incarcerated there. And uh, 
started there and i uh was there for three four years went to rancho del campo which was an honor camp for juvenile delin- uh, juveniles and um again care custody and control of the uh the kids in a camp setting and uh really had a good time with the kids um uh, most of the kids some of them you just uh they were just um out there and gone already so um but that's what i did initially and then i went to casework uh, once i got my degree in criminal justice administration went to casework and then soon after i went to casework i was called to work for the gang suppression team with uh, gang suppression unit of uh, probation which um, supervised supervised the most violent gang members in the community and we picked and choose who we worked and we were given a caseload of 50 and our job was to hold them accountable and really to put them in prison because they were the most violent most violent in in our case our case loads and probation okay steve so now we're going to get to the nitty-gritty here you are an expert on logan heights gang members and the gangs you know we know that in logan heights there's more than just Mario logan there's several sets in there you know uh, clicks you know specifically talk to us specifically those that that were recruited by the AFO or the Ariano cartel as assassins. Can you tell us how they were recruited by the AFO? Yes. Um, in 1991, 1990, 91, 92, David Barone, a Logan Heights gang member and soon to become Mexican mafia prison gang member, um, was, had done time in a federal institution in Phoenix, FCI Phoenix. And there he met uh, members of um, drug trafficking organizations, particularly the um, Javier Carl Payan drug organization, a fellow by the name of uh, Gustavo Rivera Martinez. And then a person working with the Ariano Felix organization, uh, Kitty Paez, uh, Everardo Arturo Paez Martinez. He met them in uh, a federal prison. He kind of guided them through um, the incarceration in a U.S. prison. And because of his status as, um, you know, being a, a, an almost made Mexican mafia member um, and a, you know, a hardcore person, a hardcore gang member, he was able to guide them through. And he was offered them uh, an opportunity with the cartel in Tijuana when he got out of custody. Wow. Hey, hey uh, Steve, real quick, like, um, um, I am jealous. It looks like you have great weather behind you. Um, you got, like, the wind blowing and stuff like that. I just looked at my, my weather stuff, and we're still at lingering our 114. Feels <laughs> feels hotter than that. Um, but my next, you know, you kind of answered the, the, the question that, the, that I had for you is, and who is David Barone? But can you give us more detail? I mean, you know, how, you know, how was this, this kid? Is he, you know, did you start dealing with him as a young kid? Uh, and, you know, how much background do you know on, on, on David Barone? When I came into the, um, to the, to this world of working gangs, David was already in custody for uh, committing a murder when he was 16 years old. And so he did time as a juvenile in San Quentin and uh, got out briefly. And it was the San Diego Police Department that had to deal with him because, you know, he was on the streets of Logan Heights. He was a Calle Trente, Calle Trente gang member. And so he was selling uh, PCP. He was heading several crews of people at Memorial Park where Logan Heights gang members hung out that were selling PCP for him. And he was gangbanging. He was, uh, he was a one percenter. He was the, he was the guy in the gang that led them. Uh, he was charismatic. He was violent. Um, and he was organized and he, uh, he, he was the leader of these guys. And when he was out on the street, violence went up and, you know, uh, homicides went up. And so it was San Diego PD guys like Dave Contreras and, and the gang detectives at the time that had to deal with this guy on a daily basis. I was a probation officer just coming into it uh, in 1989 when I, I heard of David and I heard that he was public enemy number one. And I heard that law enforcement in San Diego was targeting him 
and trying to get him dirty because he was into so many things, you know, manufacturing methamphetamine, laundering money through an auto uh, business. He was moving tons of cocaine for the Ariano Felix organization in Tijuana uh, through the through the um, through the ports of entry to the east. And um, he was doing everything. And, you know, this guy was just somebody that we knew we had to target. And so as early as 1989, we were involved in, in organized crime, drug enforcement, task force cases, OCDEF cases, uh, targeting David and Gustavo Rivera Martinez and Bat Marquez, um, you know, guys that were thorns in our side in, in the law enforcement community. But I was brand new, you know, and so I was, I was, you know, I was trained by guys like Dave and, and guys in DEA like Jack Robertson and um, Senegal PD, especially they were, they were our partners in this, you know, they were the guys out on the street um, and, you know, we t depended on them a lot because there was a lot of violence going on with david uh he was doing a lot of homicides in in california for the arianos you know they didn't want to draw heat to themselves in tijuana so he was doing a lot of homicides in in california and so we were um you know we were keeping an eye on him and you know the guy was just so um careful that it was just very hard to follow him around it was very hard to catch him doing anything and, you know, in 1992, he finally got wind that we were on to him and he basically um, went over to the other side of the border and stayed put in Tijuana. So so that that, that comes to me, you know, real quick, like uh, David, uh, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, Steve. So a, a lot of us has worked, you know, task forces or we've done, you know, cases through our investigations. A lot of people don't know what OSADEF means. Can you can can you, you know, get tell us what the acronym OSADEF means? Yeah, it's Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, and it's a federal grant. When you have a case that is uh, substantial and you have a leader of an organization, um, you know, that's killing and trafficking drugs and, you know, you write a proposal and it's, you know, writing a proposal uh, for a grant to the federal government. And if they accept it, there's a meeting at the U.S. Attorney's Office and you plead your case. And if they accept that, they then they give you money and they give you uh, resources, more resources. They allow you to pick a team and to provide overtime opportunity for those law enforcement agents that um, agree to play, uh, to agree to uh, work the case with you. And yeah, so you but... do get more resources. And so it's it's substantial. You know, if you open an OSADEF case on a target like David Barone, which we did, and the Ariano Felix organization we did, um, then you have, a, you know, you have the more resources, you have the more bodies, you can pay them over time. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's a good thing. And, and you know what, and no matter the size of the agency, uh, Steve, you know, here in Calexico, I started an OSODEF case back in 2004. It was regarding the M down here. They were taxing people. And so like that's so we ended up doing an OSODEF case with DEA, ATF, uh, ourselves, our, our, county, our narcotics task force. But if it wasn't for that OSA death case being approved by the uh, the U.S. Attorney uh, Attorney's Office in San Diego, I mean, it wouldn't have gone nowhere because we needed not only the the money for the manpower because I mean you're working 12, 16 hour days, seven, eight days. I mean, we're working like we used to call we're working on, on criminals time, on dopers time, on on gang time. You know, they 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 get up at three in the morning. We're up at three. We're at up at two. You know, so so people don't that are listening to us that have never done this, they probably heard it before, but they don't know how good it is because resources. Why you go up on a you go up on a on a wiretap, uh, now you have people supporting your your wiretap that you have going. Uh, I mean, you got resources coming in from. I mean, when we finally took down this big operation, it, it was part of it was we had taken we took people down Riverside County, uh, Imperial County, and San Diego County all at the same time. So imagine trying. Calexico, a city so small, trying to do a case by itself like that, we couldn't have done it. But because of the Osa death case, man, we hit all those homes at six o'clock in the morning at the same time, using four or five hundred, you know, elements out there, agents. 
out there and officers. I mean, that's that's what I just want to explain. So you, let's, let's lead on to this next one, unless you guys have a follow-up, David. You know what? Yeah, let me have a follow-up. Steve, I don't know if you know this or not, but Carlos Chacon, who's been on our show several times, him and a gentleman by the name of a lieutenant from San Diego PD, was a gang detective at the time, George Guevara, I mean, he rest in peace, died about three weeks ago, uh, were working gangs at the time, and they responded to the location. I think it was right there on 33rd and... Um, 33rd and Webster, that area where he Pain. killed Payne. Yes, 33rd and Payne, where he killed the African American man when David, I believe, was 16 years old. You mentioned about that. And Carlos stated that I guess that David came out of a party early that morning on PCP, was peeing on the guy's uh, car, I guess one of his uh, tires. The gentleman comes out like at six in the morning, confronts him. David turns around, either shoots him or attacks him, but he kills him. And it was during that time that, uh, you know, Carlos was one of the ones that prosecuted him and sent him to St. Quentin. And it was interesting that you said that at 16 or 17, he went to St. Quentin. And I mean, I remember Carlos mentioning that he was sentenced as an adult, you know, to St. Quentin. And that was unheard of back then. But there were special occasions like him, a, a murderer that went and and the other thing that I wanted to mention is right here, we got Lupe. He says he ran into David in May of 1992 on Boston and 30th, a few houses from the Salcidos. Both of you and I know who the Salcidos were at the time. I was working Logan Heights at the time, me and Van Cruz. And I remember one of our sources told us that David was going to be at a house. I believe it was at the 3100 block of Valle. I can't remember exactly who was living at the house. So we got our team together. We go and we hit the house. We surrounded the house. And it was about that time. That's why I know that this is a fact that what Lupe is saying, because it was about May 1992. One of the guys, they called him Rojo, takes off running. And as he's running through the back door, we got it covered. But he's, for whatever reason, he ran past our, uh, you know, perimeter. And as he's running, he's firing off shots in the air. He's firing off shots. So we all break perimeter. We're chasing him. We ended up catching him over there by the elementary school at uh, 33rd, I mean, 30, 32nd and, uh, and Valle. And we later that evening found out that David was at that house. And they had it set up that when we hit the house, this guy was going to go and shoot off rounds. So, yeah, everything you're saying, he was in that area in 91, 92. Uh, it's very interesting, and Lupe just confirmed that. That's interesting. Go ahead, Ch go ahead, uh, Chavo. Hey, hey, so, so you know, um, you know, let's get back into this. So, so my our qu my question is: is how did David Barone become the chief assassin for the Arianos? And then, as soon as you answer that, and you can probably mold it in, how can you tell? What can you tell us about that that massacre in Puerto Vallarta? Too. So, remember, number one is how did he become the El Medo Chingon chief assassin for for the AFO? David, David, um, David was tasked by Ramon Ariano Felix to kill certain people that um, were going against the Ariano Felix organization to locate and kill anybody associated with their rivals, Chapo Guzman, Mayo Zambada, uh, Amaro Carrillo. Uh, wet Obama. So there were, you know, once there was a war between the Arellanos and Chapa Guzman, and it was a, over a personal thing that happened in the mid 80s. And the Arellanos at the time couldn't do anything about it because Chapo's uh, associate was hooked up with some very heavy people. And so they waited till they took control of Tijuana and that this individual, Raya Lopez, showed up at Miles Zambada's birthday party at Club Britannica, um, 1990. And Ramon got the okay from Benjamin and executed him out in front. Um, so that was an old beef. Um, basically, Raya Lopez stole Enadina from, from the ranch in Sinaloa uh, when she was a teenager back in the early 80s. And um, they saw it as a rape situation. And and they couldn't do anything really uh, about it. They did report it to the police, uh, but they waited. They bided their time. Uh, but they don't forget the Arianos. They don't forget 
who has crossed them. And, and if you're part of the family that's crossed them, they'll kill you too. And so that's just the way they ruled by terror. And when um, Ryo showed up to Mayo Zambada's birthday party, the Ibrianos were throwing for him in Tijuana, they killed him. And so that started the war between Chapo Guzman and the Arellanos. Um, they tried to have meetings to iron things out, but they they were both so bloodthirsty, they kept trying to kill each other. And eventually, um, the Arellanos were at war with everybody, with all the other uh, cartels in the Mexican Federation, the Juarez cartel, the Sinaloa cartel. Uh, and so um, it was them against everybody else. Uh, Christine's was a, a turning point, just like the murder of Kiki Camarena was a turning point in 1985 um, that caused the, the arrest of the, you know, the La Familia cartel and that were based in Guadalajara, born in Sinaloa. Um, it was a turning point. You know, uh, they had to geographically split their organization and they got along. They still got along, although they were geographically split. They were still the Federation. But 1992, when Chapo attempted to kill the Arellano Felix brother and their and their brass at Christine's discotheque in Puerto Vallarta, that sealed the war between the Arellanos and Mayo and Chapo. And so um, David became that guy that saved the Arellanos and, and at Christine's discotheque. He was there as a an enforcer. He had done some murders for the Arellanos and he had done it well and very efficiently. Um, and so when he saved their butts at Christine's discotheque, he, be, uh, you know, ben Ham, when the dust settled, Benjamin took him aside to Juana and said, you know, you're my guy. You're going to head my uh, my enforcement squads because obviously I'm at war with Chapo and Mayo. You know, they're taking his side. And eventually uh, Mato Carrillo did, you know, and Wet Obama. And so um, they, they had to beef up security. And David was the guy to do that. They gave him a hundreds of thousands of dollars to recruit brave people like him. And so, you know, he recruited from the Logan Heights gang, you know, the gang that he was from. He also recruited from the Mexican mafia and he also recruited from, you know, good Mexican mafia soldiers that uh, he and others close to him had met in the prison system. Wow. And, and, and you, and you kind of led into the next question is just the fact that, you know, you know, how did David, Baron influence and convince the other people you just mentioned, you know, the Logan Height members to cross the border actually and work for the for the AFO and then become paid sicarios and assassins for them. I mean, how, you know, that 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 I mean, just the fact that you could say he was charismatic at one point, he knew how to talk to people. Is that what he used to convince them to go south, or was it that the that the uh, AFO was paying a lot of money at the time? You know, it's all of those things, Cello. Um, you know, uh, and. Not November 8th, 1992, the date of that ambush, um, that was the turning point. David was taken aside. He was given hundreds of thousands of dollars to recruit people like him. Um, David was a one percenter. He was a leader in the neighborhood of Logan Heights. You know, there were different factions. You know, there was Terese, there was 33rd Street, there was, you, you know, Calle Trente, and there was Red Steps. Um, David told the guys basically he sent his brother-in-law um marcos quinona sanchez pato quinones sent his brother-in-law across and told the guys hey um david needs guys to work for some very important people in tijuana you know i didn't know who the arianos were in 1992 and i don't think they did either um so they went down to work for some very important people but when, you know uh in in november of 1992 about 40 gang members from logan heights went down to the border uh, they were met by david or people close to him like alfredo avila um big popeye and otto quinone is david's brother-in-law and they were taken to safe houses they had to hide their heads cover their heads or put blindfolds on uh, and they went to these different um houses that were rented by david they were called offices and they went to uh, three or four different houses and there were probably 13 or 14 gang members in each house and when they got to these houses or offices they were issued you know ammunition 
uh, a long arm, an AK, an automatic weapon, uh, Super 38. They were given am ammunition. They were given body armor. They were given grenades and um, they were taught how to shoot. And their daily routine was basically being available at these houses where there were two way radios and they were called on to do certain things, primarily escorting the five Ariano feelers through Tijuana uh, while they were doing their daily business, doing their drug deals, uh, corrupting public officials, having meetings. Um, but there were a few um, through training that were picked out that were really good with um, automatic weapons that were really good uh, tactically speaking. And so they were uh, picked to go on missions to kill people, anybody associated with the Ariano Felix organization. I mean, hey, Steve, what, with their enemies. Steve, one of our listeners, Ishmael, mentioned Casper, Zigzag, Dopey, Cracks, Roach, Spooky, Trigger, Tarzan, Charro, Smokey, Cougar, Happy, Night Owl, Pee Wee. Those are some of the names I'm sure that you knew very well, every one of those individuals, plus many more, correct? Yes, yes, those are, that's exact. Yeah, that's exact. Um, whoever your listener is, he's right on. Um, you know, the, 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 the guys that they could depend on, the one percenters, the guys that would gangbang and do drive-by shootings, um, guys that um, were loyal to David, uh, Marcos Quinones, you know, Sailor, Juan Felix, the people that were leaders of the gang at the time that were selling the PCP and that were doing the gang banging and doing the killings and the retaliations for killings. Um, those were the guys that were handpicked to go down there. Not all of them chose to go down. Um, you know, Juan Felix, especially, he was illegal. He was using a, an alias. And sorry, there's mosquitoes out here. And um, he had a wife in Chula Vista and he had a lot to lose by going down there. So he stayed on our side of the border in San Diego and ran interference for David here. But that was David's best buddy. And he was a guy that eventually we targeted to try to get to David. Hey, Steve, one of the questions from Lupe is, in those days, they weren't allowed to get high while on duty. It was a deadly sin. Is that true? Yes. You know, well, you're bringing a bunch of gangbangers that um, are used to doing that shit on the streets in San Diego. You're bringing the guys like that down to Tijuana. And David uh, ran it uh, very, he had a very structured, um, it was paramilitaristic basically. And he had rules, you know, you can't get high. Um, you go home two times a week. You don't tell anybody what you do. Um, you don't mention the Ariano Felix's name. You don't, you know, you don't shoot your mouth off. You don't get, you know, you don't draw attention to yourself. In fact, you don't look like a gangbanger anymore. You would try to wash the prison out of you and make you look more preppy so that you're not standing out. You're not a 50 footer, you know, you're not, you know, drawing attention to yourself. And he tried to wash those gang habits out of the gang members, which is really hard to do. And so a lot of them got into trouble um, doing that. And, and David would give them an opportunity to get the hell out. Sometimes he'd just kill them, you know, he thinks you're, you know, you're a badass. You know, you want to, you want to go against the rules. Let's go, you know, let's fight it out. Let's shoot it out, you know? And so a lot of different stories about David. He was a crazy person, but he led by example. And uh, these guys were really loyal to him. Hey, hey, hey uh, real quick, like Steve, I mean, all the pictures that I look at, it looks like, uh, you know, David's pretty well built, man. Was he uh, physically fit like a, could he bench press a Volkswagen or, or, or he just, he looks that way. David was a, uh, diminutive he was um probably five 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 six um there were times in his life where he was sucked up when he was using you know drugs and there were times in his life when he was working out um and he was also using steroids so he was very much into his image um you know uh i don't think he was overly built you know um but he was crazy you know if he if he if you pissed him off, you were dead, you know, and I heard story after story after story about the guy. And, um, you know, many of the guys that we approach to um, testify or to work as informants against him were just deathly afraid of him. And, you know, 
it, it was real tough to crack him because he was still out there and alive and working for the Arianos and having all that, that power behind him. Sure. Hey, hey Steve, uh, we have a question from Donald Rompetas. Uh, basically, I know this show is about Logan Heights. We're talking about those assassins, but there's one that also stands out from Del Sol. We got uh, Albert Marquez, a.k.a. Bat or Dingbat. Can you tell us? I know he was very close. He's a member of the Mexican Mafia. He's currently incarcerated in uh, Colorado at ADX. But can you tell us his role in Tijuana and how he got there? Um, David basically did him a favor. You know, Bat was uh, kind of out of control. He was a user. He was um, he was um, wild, uh, untamed. But you know, he did he, he put in his work for them for the Mexican mafia. Um, and since he was a brother, and since he you know raised his hand for David, uh, when Bat got out of jail, um, when the times when Bat was out of jail in the nineties. Uh, he worked with David and was protected by David. Um, you know, they tried to wash the prison out of that. And they tried to wash that attitude and that, you know, just his look, um, you know, because, you know, you could see that guy was a, a thug a mile away, you know. And so uh, he had guys try to wash the prison out of him and and, uh, and he protected him because Bat was a drug user. Um, he was he was crazy, untamed again, like I said, and. David would try to put him with individuals that would socialize him. Um, and uh, not everybody liked working with that because he was reckless and, and careless and uh, drug addicted and, you know, always high. Um, but he had David there to protect him. And so um, David protected him as long as he could, as long as he was alive. And then once David died in 1997, um, Gustavo Rivera, David's compadre, um, took him in and protected him and let him work for him. But that was, you know, we, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Steve, go ahead. No, that was a one percenter uh, as far as Southern California goes, as far as the prison system goes, but in a uh, structured environment, working for a drug cartel at that level, he was a, a liability. Steve, for whatever reason, people here in America think believe that every Mexican cop is dirty, every Mexican cop is on the take. But I'm here to tell you, and I, I know that you know this for a fact, that there are so many great Mexican cops that are clean, that are there, and that truly believe that they can make a difference. And with that said, here's one right here. Jose Luis Pepe Patino Moreno, he was a director of federal public ministry, came from Mexico City to clean up not only law enforcement, but to take into custody the Arellanos. I never had a chance to meet with him. I had heard a lot about him at the time. You got a chance to work with him. This guy's a true Mexican hero. And I've heard during your presentations, I've heard you talk about him. Do you mind telling our audience who this Mexican hero was? David? Yes, we could hear Did you I now. Part, I missed the last part of that question. Yeah, do you uh, mind telling yes, do you mind telling our audience who this Mexican hero was, Jose Luis Patino? We yeah, we call him Pepe Patino. And at the time we had a very close working relationship with the government of Mexico. Um, and this is this is the mid nineties. And there was a doctor, Dr. Samuel Sanchez um, from Mexico that would come up and we would strategize on how to arrest David Barone. Um, he was he was probably the first case uh, and the easiest case or the smallest case, the less most uh, the least complex case. And so we were trying to get David first. Um, and then from, you know, from investigating David and the murder of the Cardinal, which was our focus, um, we 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 evolved into um, uh, indicting the upper echelon of the organization, the Ariano Felix brothers, but David, David was the starting point. Um, and, you know, I know we haven't talked about it yet, but soon after Christine's, um, David, uh, was sent to Guadalajara because, uh, informants were telling Benjamin and Ramon Ariano Felix that, uh, Chapa Guzman was going to be there. And, you know, eventually they got information that he was going to be at the Guadalajara airport and it was, 
in a, in a white grand marquee. And so when a white grand marquee rolled into the airport, they shot the occupants and it turned out to be a Catholic cardinal, which is something you don't do in Mexico, especially at that time. And that drew a lot of heat to the Arianos. So, you know, they had to go underground at that time. Um, and so this was 1993, late 1993. And You froze up on us, Steve. He'll come right back. I lost I lost you guys for a second. But we use that yeah. term vetted um, because we put them through um, a series of tests to make sure that they're, you know, they're they have integrity. And um, and, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, you there's a lot of cops in Mexico or, you know, the majority, the vast majority are working for somebody or working um other jobs that are not considered um legal here in the united states but in mexico it's a different story you know a uh, cop job is a last resort job uh, they don't get paid well they don't get benefits um and so they have to um, do other things in order to supplement their income um but their definition of 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 corruption in Mexico is when you work for the cartel, you know, because everything else is accepted, you know, stealing cars in the United States and bring it in Mexico and dealing with the insurance companies or, you know, um, victimizing gringos that go down there on vacation and getting money out of them. You know, that's socially accepted. And, you know, but, you know, to, to the Mexican cop, once, once they start working for the cartel and they're bought and paid for by the cartel, that's, that's corruption to them, you know? So, but we do ha do here, understand what they go through in mexico it's a different environment and we need to understand you know what they go through so that we can work better with them but you know um the guys that we work, work with you know the guys um uh, pepe patino we thought was true blue he was actually living in the united states uh for his own safety but working with us and you know once he once he crossed that border um he was picked up by Ismael Higuera Guerrero's people, who was the head of the organization at the time and, and uh, for the Tijuana cartel after the murder of the Cardinal. Um, you know, the Arianos had to go underground. So um, their top lieutenant, Ismael Higuera Guerrero, took over. And he was the one that was behind the, um, the, um, the pickup, the torture, and the murder of Pepe, T Pepe Patino and two of his guys. And so, you know, we found that out later, you know, we found that um, uh, what he had did and why he did that. And so, um, you know, Pepe was a hero and he worked very closely with us um, and he was he was loyal to us, whether he was working with somebody else, another cartel. I don't know. But that often is the case, just like Hanaro Garcia Luna, who was very close to us and that helped us through decades against the Ariano Felix organization. And now we find out it's because he was working for the Beltran Labor Organization. He was working for Miles Zambada. He was working for Chapo Guzman. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it uh, sometimes we don't find things out later, but we always suspect that if somebody is loyal to us and working with us, they have a common enemy and they're probably working with another cartel that that uh, that that we are sh share a, a common enemy with. Yeah, I remember reading, Steve, and I remember during your presentation, you talked about how they viciously tortured him. And after they tortured him, they staged a car accident in La Rumorosa going toward, uh, I guess, going toward uh, Mexicali up the mountains there of Tijuana. And it was all staged. And it took a while for the truth to come out that they were actually, their bodies were mutilated, not by the accident, but by the Arellano cartel members. Yes, I mean they were he, they were beaten with a baseball bat by Ismail Higuera Guerrero himself. He was a very evil person and loved torturing people and took a took um, you know had just took a sexual pleasure out of it. He was one of those uh, truly evil and psychotic people um, that um, that took pleasure at beating people and uh, just beat them. Uh, it. it you know, when we were taken into a room about three or four days after their disappearance, uh, we were told that they were possibly put through a meat grinder. Holy 
And um, but we later found out that they were just beaten uh, repeatedly with a baseball bat, you know, and their deaths were staged. Um, but we do know it was Ismael Higuera Guerrero that that was behind that and another comandante that was working with him that was on his payroll that gave up Pepe Patino. A guy wow. named, uh, we, we call him Capi. And he worked, uh, Capi worked very closely with DEA in, in Tijuana, but he was the guy that set up Pepe Patino. Wow. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that. Can you also talk about this case? Very interesting case. Fernando Gutierrez. Fernando Gutierrez came, came, came from a very rich family, influential family in Tijuana, got involved with uh, the narco world, uh, got in depth, and he was murdered. Actually, that was one of the first ones that made basically the news in California or in San Diego uh, of his murder. I guess it was in uh, uh, Silver Strand, going toward, on Silver Strand, going toward Coronado. Can you talk a little bit about that case? Yes. Um, you know, at the time, the, um, the head agent of the Arano Felix task force was Jack Robertson. He was a DEA agent who was a, was a, was a an awesome leader and gave everybody credit, you know? And so, you know, like David Barone, Barone was in his world, Jack was, was our leader in our world and, you know, for the good side. And, um, Jack found out that, um, that the Colombians put a contract out on Fernando Gutierrez through the Ariano Felix organization, because, uh, Fernando Gutierrez was given six million by the Colombians who controlled cocaine trafficking in the early 90s um, to build a mall. And Fernando just basically went to San Diego and he was living in Rancho Santa Fe or Coronado. And he was playing polo. He was, you know, with the rich crowd. And so the contract went out on, um, on Gutierrez and um, he didn't, uh, I mean, well, they asked him for the money and he basically blew him off. And so then a contract was put out on him. And Jack Robertson found out through one of his many informants that there was a contract to kill Fernando. And so, you know, we as law enforcement, we have to notify um, the subject. And so Jack and one of his partners went out and notified Fernando Gutierrez that he had a hit against him. Uh, Fernando Gutierrez contacted the Colombians and said, oh no, I'll get your money, I'll get your money. And they said, no, that's all right, that's fine. We don't need your money. And so um, uh, one of my informants uh, who had a contact with DMV actually ran the plate um, or actually gave them information as to what vehicle Fernando Gutierrez drove. And David sent some gangbangers from Logan Heights into San Diego and they uh, were driving another vehicle and they drove up alongside Fernando Gutierrez on the strand and fired six rounds into the side of his head, you know, from a moving vehicle and killed him. And it was a, it was a San Diego Sheriff's case, uh, run by Victor Coloca. And I, um, later on when I found out who did it and how, you know, and where they got the guns, um, I, I hooked up with Victor Coloca at San Diego Sheriff's homicide. And we were able to, um, you know, basically figure out what happened and who was involved. However, um, our U.S. Attorney's Office at the time um, didn't pursue the homicides. Um, you know, they were going after the big fish and they didn't want to burn their case on the little fish that were actually doing, you know, the uh, homicides and the violent acts here in our own backyard. Yeah, and th that individual leads us into the next question. What happened to uh, to uh, Pee Wee Jarbo, Michael Pee Wee Jarbo? Uh, I before the show, I was telling you I remember him as a kid working Logan Heights in ninety, ninety one, ninety three, and he was that kid that um, was always quiet, was that introvert, and he was that kid when I drove up, all the guys would you know start talking or whatever. He was a guy always in the corner that never talked. He was that introvert. He later, he was one of the first, I believe, that went to Tijuana, became an assassin, and he definitely put in a lot of work for the for the Arellanos. And I believe that he was one of the assassins that killed uh, Gutierrez, correct? Yes, yes, he was one of the, 
he he and a, 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 another gang member from the Pozole gang in Oceanside, uh, Big John Neenan, um, were the ones that killed um, Fernando Gutierrez. And they got the guns from um, some Logan Trece gang member. Um, oh, what was his name? Dopey or... Oh. But he had he had uh, he had done a burglary on a, a defense attorney on his house and got some guns from the house, and they used those guns um, from this SA gang member in order to do that homicide. Um, Michael Anthony Jarbo, Pee Wee. Um, I don't know if he was in the first round of gang members that went down to Mexico. Um, I know he was a Red Step gang member, and there were Red Steps gang there. Uh, like Hector Villegas, who now, now works for Cesar Chavez schools and uh, mm -hmm. who were down there when they were juveniles and actually took part in the, in the murder of the Cardinal, you know, and uh, who got away with it because um, our U.S. Attorney's Office didn't want to pursue it. But we knew exactly who was doing things. And um, but, you know, but they find excuses. Oh, he's a juvenile. We can't prosecute. You know, it's too difficult to prosecute a juvenile. Well, you know, the dude killed the Cardinal. You know, he was down there killing people and, you know, he was down there working as an, an enforcer and he and he brought AK-47s back to San Diego that were used in the murder of Mimi Barraza, you know, um, you know, later on. So a lot of this, a lot of these guys that had worked as enforcers like Jarbo and like Hector Villegas, Silly or Lepo, whatever you want to call them, these guys were were killing people. And they were bringing their guns back after the uh, accidental murder of the Cardinal. They were bringing their guns across to San Diego and using them in homicides here and selling them to other gang members. And, you know, and the gang and the gang cops and the gang detectives and the San Diego PD guys were telling me these guys are killing people with those guns that they use down there. You know, they're doing, you know, what they did there here. And, you know, you're the guy that's. You know, you have an OCDEF case. You're hooked up with the U.S. Attorney's Office. You need to do us a favor and take these guys off the streets because they're killing people here. And our U.S. Attorney's Office wouldn't do it. And, you know, and, and it's a big frustration to this day um, that they allowed these guys back out on the streets without prosecuting them or holding them accountable. And, you know, there's guys out there right now, you know, like Hector Villegas, you know, and Maybe he's doing good now. I met him actually, you know, reading Dr. Seuss books at Cesar Chavez Elementary. But, you know, just just seeing him, you know, out and about, um, it pisses me off because he was never held accountable. Um, and so, you know, because our U.S. Attorney's Office wanted to go out after the big fish. And I think it was just because they were afraid to go to trial. You know, um, ultimately, we never went to trial in any Ariano Felix um individual in the in the federal side it was the state side you know attorneys like you know mark amador and james fontaine and owens that um took ariano felix guys to trial and even went death penalty and that that's really the only closure we ever got on anybody ariano felix uh related was through the state and you know it was our federal prosecutors that for three decades were on the case that never took one to trial you know, they were just gun shy and it just caused a lot of um, a lot of um, a lot of detachment between our law enforcement community and the, and the U.S. attorney's office because they never they never went for their throats like our DA's office did. They never sent the message like our DA's office did to uh, that. You can't do this here. You know, you're not going to get away with it. And we're going to prosecute everybody involved and not just particular people. You know, and even though, you know, we have to work 724, unlike the U.S. Attorney's Office, which works their, you know, five, six hour days, uh, we're going to take this to the limit. And and some of my federal partners in DEA um, never got to see closure like I did because, you know, I'm a local guy and I was the guy they could reach out to to help, um, you know, with their state cases. And so, um, yeah, it was um, it was it was a very frustrating case, although we did prosecute, you know, the brothers here in the United States, we did extradited them. They did cooperate to some extent. Um, and then the others were killed, which brings some, a lot of comfort to us. Uh, we, they were never fully held accountable of the thousands of deaths that they were responsible for thousands. And I'm talking thousands of deaths that they were responsible for. 
Steve, what happened to Pee Wee Jarbo? Is he still alive? And uh, what happened to John uh, Noonan, the guy from Oceanside? Is he still alive? No, John uh, John Noonan was killed by David Barone because um, he was misbehaving, I guess you'd call it. He was getting too big for his britches. So David shot it out with him and killed him in uh, Rosarita and left him on the side of the road. And I believe it was 1996. Pee Wee Jarbo was was killed later on after david's death Pee Wee went to work with uh david's compadre gustavo rivero martinez Bayuno, and went to work for him and he was sent down to chiapas uh, one of those trampoline countries to uh to move coke uh in from colombia into the united states and he screwed up somehow and david killed i mean uh, gustavo rivera personally killed him and uh, he never held accountable for uh, Gustavo Rivera's was ex- Gustavo Rivera was extradited three years ago after he was arrested in Cabo San Lucas in 2008. And we were there. Uh, he was finally extradited. He was extradited on the same plane as Maito Gordo, uh, Miles Zambada's son, uh, who Gus tried to blow up Miles' daughter at her quinceanera in 1994. And it was just it was funny that Gus and Maito Gordo were were sitting in the same courtroom and knew each other uh, and not knowing that Gus had tried to blow up his father's um, party for uh, his daughter's quinceanera back in 1994 in Guadalajara. Uh, but Gus was uh, extradited three years ago and we're still awaiting trial for him. And that was my case. Um, uh, it was I was the lead agent on that case, I should say, uh, until you know my agency, Department of Justice, kept you know, spreading me around so thinly that I couldn't maintain control of it. Um, and, you know, another frustration, you know, agencies don't even back you up when they're the most important cases to the state of California or to your region. Um, they, they have you off on other things, trying to dilute your involvement because for one reason or another, you know, and that's probably another story. Uh, oh, Steve, but, we're yeah. definitely, we're definitely bringing you back to talk about Gus Rivera's case. I went through your presentation several times on that case. What an outstanding, the work that you guys did as a team, outstanding. With that said, we have a quick question from Netha that basically says, says, uh, so all the hired assassins were from Logan Heights and Pozole. Any other barrios get recruited to become assassins back then? You know, it was just the, the different factions of Logan Heights um Pasole, there were some guys from la um you know black dan barella but those guys were that got those those were the, you know they were just more interested in feeding their heroin habit, uh, habits and they didn't last in tj um you know they were they couldn't follow the rules they were you know they were sucked up the those basically you know old school mexican mafia that you know had already made their bones and now they were just tired and they wanted to feed their habit all the time so those guys, you know, guys like Gino Madriaga, they weren't on the same level as um, the, the Tijuana cartel. And they weren't of much use to them uh, other than maybe to collect payments from people that owed money. Um, so the Mexican Mafia really never had a stronghold in the Ariano Felix organization. David was their representative and their big brown hope you know, with the organization as told by many, many uh, Mexican Mafia dropouts. But um, you know, guys like that, Marquez couldn't handle the structure, um, although he was protected by David. And then once David died, he was protected by Gustavo Rivera, who was, you know, David's compadre and did him that favor. But, you know, those guys really never made it. The Mexican mafia really never made it in the, in the Tijuana cartel uh, other than David Barone and 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 that just because he was David's buddy. Steve, we have three more questions, but we're going to skip the questions. Uh, we're going to go to the last question. We've been on it for an hour. Literally, it feels like it's five minutes. Thank you once again, brother, for, I mean, this is a very, very interesting subject. You're the expert. But the last question is this. Tell us about David Barron's death and about the Blancornelas murderer uh, or the attempt murder of uh, Blancornelas. And uh, tell us who Blancornelas was. For our listeners or those that don't know, but tell us about his death. And that'll be the last question, Steve. You know, David, um, that's a long question. It's a long answer. And yes. I recently, within the last year, wrote um, a story on 1997 because there were so many events that year. 
Um, you know, Juan Cornelis was the editor of Zeta um, newspaper in Tijuana, and I read it every day. Um, they're very good. And in in the late 1980s, um, um, Jesus Blanc Cornelis partner, Hector Gato Felix, was, was killed by somebody associated with Hank Roan. And so every day, every week in his edition, he has a page dedicated to finding the murderers of his co-editor, Gato Felix. Um, and so he, and he saw the association with Hank Roan, or he thought there was an association with Hank Roan and the, and the Arianos. And so he would throw down the Arianos every ch chance he could. And so in his, his weekly editions, and to this day, you know, they, they basically front off the cartel people. They front off the government that's, that's working with the cartel and that's allowed them to work. Um, it's a bold and brave magazine. And recently in 1997, I wrote something for the editor there, Adele Navarro, about the events in 1997 that led up to the murder of Blanco Cornelis. Because it takes a lot of exp explaining because, you know, in, during the year of 1997, a new general, General Chavez, and a new major, Felipe Perez Cruz, were brought in to Tijuana as the, the head of the army to do the law enforcement functions there. And they wouldn't take the bribes of the Arellanos. So um, they kept sending messages to these guys, you better take or you're going to get killed. And so um, David finally killed the girlfriend of Felipe Perez Cruz. Her name was Elaine Wocascio, and she worked at a, an Italian restaurant in Tijuana. And so it, I think it was uh, September of 1997 when David tried to send a message to the major uh, to, to knock it off, stop arresting their guys. And he assassinated his girlfriend in the restaurant during lunch hour. And so uh, a week later, two weeks later, um, Felipe Perez Cruz, the major, arrested David's uh, compadre, Kitty Paez, at his sushi bar and got on the radio and taunted David, saying, you know, basically, fuck you, David. Uh, I'm not going to give up. And so a few weeks later, uh, David shoots two of the major's men in front of, of the courthouse that were driving a vehicle identical to the major's uh, and shot two of his men. And so, you know, the major was pissed. Uh, Blanc Cornelis got a hold of it and called David you know, an idiot that can't shoot straight, his band of uh, Logan gang members. And so David took it personally and went after Blanc Cornelis. And on Thanksgiving Day of 1997, ambushed Blanc Cornelis, two vehicles, uh, one stolen out of San Diego and one bought uh, out of San Diego by a gentleman by the name of Ron Brill that did a lot of favors for Gustavo Rivera and David Barone, and that's still out there to this day, would armor their vehicles, would, would equip it with police lights that would get vehicles used in homicides brought down to Tijuana. Well, he, Ron Burrell, did uh, provide one of the vehicles that David was driving in to kill Blanc Cornelis. And David, um, you know, the, the two vehicles uh, out of San Diego um, ambushed Blanc Cornelis, and both vehicles emptied, and they were approaching Blanc Cornelis's vehicle. It was a red Suburban and just kept shooting and shooting and shooting. And then a fragmented round from one of the other vehicles, um, one of other the Barone's vehicles basically um, fragmented and penetrated David's left eye. And David, as he was approaching the vehicle in, a, in an armored vest um, with a, with a uh, Mossberg shotgun who wanted to make it personal, who wanted Blanc Cornelis to see him execute him was killed there on the bleak uh, on the street corner and it was Blanc Cornelis's own son Caesar that took photos of the scene um, knowing that his dad had been shot numerous times not knowing if he was going to survive or not um, but it was very historic um, you know that David died in this way we had just secretly indicted him uh, months earlier and had approached the family of his second wife who thought David was an upstanding person. And we actually showed pictures of David's M8 tattoos of his, you know, of, of the murders that he did and tried to get them on our side. Um, but, you know, we went through so much that year and so much led up to the murder of Blanc Cornelis. And I wanted, you know, the editors of Zeta to understand 
this, this is this is how it happened and this is why it happened and so much wasn't said because nothing was ever shared with you because you know yeah we knew exactly what happened or or for the most part what happened but you know our u.s attorney's office didn't want to you know didn't want to prosecute it to its fullest and even drop this case eventually um because they just didn't want to pursue it anymore um you know it was old history um but they never held anybody accountable so i wanted to explain that to adela navarro to the to the editors of that set the magazine because i know blanc ornelas means a lot to them and i know his family means a lot to them and they should know what really happened so i wrote this long story for adela within the last year so that they would have some closure because you know they still publish in the newspaper um, they're still reminded, um, they still celebrate the anniversary of his death in that shootout. Um, although he survived that shootout, you know, he died of natural causes years later. Steve, did they ever publish your story? Excuse me? Did they publish your story? No. The story that you wrote? Are they going to no. publish it? No, and I, I, I didn't necessarily want them to. I just wanted them to understand. Um, why and how he was killed you know just like uh, francisco ortiz who was killed in 2006 you know that was done by gustavo rivera's crew and you know they they have some faulty information as to who did it but you know we knew exactly who did it and that's another editor of zeta that was murdered by the arianos and i wanted them to know about that too um because it was never we never did anything about it here you know we never held anybody accountable um, you know, the case was pled out, um, uh, the people responsible for it were never indicted. Um, so, you know, it, there comes a time when you need to let people know what happened so to give family the closure and his, and his loved ones closure. Steve, I don't know if you were aware, well, you and I, we've talked about, I don't know if you remember, but you see David, you mentioned that he's wearing a bulletproof vest a month before San Diego PD took several I, I guess it was close to 100 bulletproof, bulletproof vests and gave them to the Tijuana Municipal Police Department. He was wearing one of the vests right there in that picture that San Diego PD gave him uh, a month before. I don't know if you were aware of that, but uh, that's one of the vests. And Chalo, you had talked about donating vests also through uh, a DOJ uh, liaison. Uh, in that picture, he's wearing a San Diego PD vest. Uh, wow. Unbelievable, huh? I, yeah, I didn't yeah. know that, David, and we didn't know much about David, uh, David Barone. I mean, we didn't have a current picture of him. We knew who his second wife was. Um, we didn't really know a lot about him. You know, we took down Juan Felix to get to him, you know, in a case, you know, that we worked jointly with, you know, an OCDF case that we worked with San Diego PD, with CSU and, and GST. We took off Juan Felix and Juan Felix ended up you know, eventually cooperating against David because he didn't want to go to jail for the rest of his life. We had a very good case against him. You know, so we were we were trying to target the people closest to David on this side of the border, anybody associated with the murder of the Cardinal. And we started getting people to cooperate against David. And we built an indictment against him. And our, and our base, our, our charge in our conspiracy case, uh, our federal conspiracy case was the murder of the Cardinal. Um, and other crimes that happened in Mexico and the United States that David was responsible for and had a leadership role in. And so, um, you know, Juan Felix was the big fish. You know, we got him with, um, you know, a gallon or so of PCP, a few pounds of uh, uh, methamphetamine. We had him delivering, you know, methamphetamine and weapons to us at a, an offsite that we created um, because he liked body shops. Um, you know, we, we, we got him in a, in a, in a situation that he couldn't refuse to cooperate with us. And so he was, he was our key witness in indicting David Barone, him and other witnesses that came along and then other people in the upper echelon of the uh, Ariano Felix organization. So, um, you know, Juan Felix was key. He was somebody living here under our nose that was doing David's dirty work, you know, uh, keeping the weapons for him for all the homicides that he did in Southern California. Um, and, you know, we finally got to him, you know, maybe a couple of years later, but we got to him and ended up uh, using him and a lot of other gangbangers that, you know, people said would never cooperate with us to indict David Barone. You know, so it was his own people that turned him in. Yeah. 
Steve, I'll tell you, we're over a, an hour 11. This is probably the longest show, but it's the fastest we've ever had. We're very grateful. Thank you for coming on. And you know what? You definitely have a second date with us. You definitely, Thanks, David. definitely want you to come back without a doubt. Thanks. With that said, Chalo, do you have anything for Steve? No, I just want to say thanks a lot, Steve. You know, um, yeah. you know, hearing from you, being there, working the stuff, you know, kind of puts things into perspective for some of us that were working the streets during that time here in the, at the border of Colexco in Mexicali and knowing that the AF, AFO, you know, had a big influence down on everything that was happening here in, in, in Mexicali and Colexico and Pearl Valley. We had a lot of dope coming across during that time, especially Coke. Uh, it was crazy, man. Uh, you know, we would hear all the gunshots south of Calexico, you know, we're in the same area. Uh, if for anybody that knows where Calexico is at, I mean, we only have a border <laughs> fence that separates us. I mean, we breathe there, the same air, have everything the same. So uh, that's where Kiki's from. Yeah, Kiki. I knew, I knew Kiki. That's where Kiki's from, and Kiki's all of our hero. Yeah, I, I, I knew Kiki personally. He's you know me since I was a little kid. My dad's friend, so I mean, it's one of the reasons why I became a cop too. It was Kiki, Joe Nava, Arnold Brown, you know Armando Nunez, all these guys. They were all law enforcement people in the. That's that's who I looked up to, or my mentors growing up. So yeah, we can never we can never let people forget, especially our cops, who Kiki was and what he yeah. means to us. Yeah. Yeah, I still think I still stay in contact sometimes with Mika, his wife. Uh, she'll call me up once in a while and ask me stuff, and and so I'll be seeing her in September. We're trying to get uh, Kiki's schools. Uh, it, they've been in trailers for the last yes, we, we were just 15, talking about that years. at our foundation meeting. Oh, okay, so so you're part of the foundation. Yeah, okay, cool. Oh yeah, he, he is a, a foundation. Yeah. He is a foundation. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, so his son called me up. His son yeah. and his widow. Yeah, yeah, Kiki Junior, little Kikito. <laughs> I remember when he was a little kid. So I'm trying hey, to get Steve. him to come up here. Yeah. He'll go. It, it, it's, it's been warm and it's been warm in San Diego, so I'm pretty sure he'll he'll, he'll want to go up there. Hey, Steve, we got Lupe. He's saying, Coach, Coach Duncan. For him to call you Coach Duncan, there's a reason why, right? He probably knew you in juvenile hall back then. <laughs> Hi, Lupe. I hope yeah. you're doing well. Yeah, he looks that like was he always our well. first priority to keep you guys in line. That's right. Benny, any last words for Steve? You know, Steve, uh, Kiki arrested me when I was in high school. High school <laughs> dance, I got in a fight. He took me into custody and drove me to my grandma's house, uh -oh. where it was worse than where it was worse than CYA. Yep, La Chancla. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, Steve, you were so spot on on cases that are picked and unpicked for prosecution. Or where they want to, or where they, or where they want the resources to go. You know, you got the plea bargains, behind the scene deals, and the criminal basically gets away. I mean, you experience that. You're not the only one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, you know, when we started putting this thing together, our today's a podcast. You know, because it takes work. I mean, to put all these things together. And I started remembering. I remember uh, one time being in TJ with the FBI. We were out there on a, on a different case and. Uh, walked in the uh, commandante and he wants to he wants to, he's asking us if we want to go see a torture chamber that they just they just discovered so of course we want to say yeah we want to go look and i'm telling you man we went there it was an auto shop it was uh it was it was gruesome i mean it was just uh like in the movies man just like a horror movie body parts and and the way they were handling the scene i was looking at it and i says oh my god we would never handle a case a scene like the way they were handling that scene unbelievable but just brought back so many memories you know just uh yeah thank you for coming on and i'll see you in las vegas i guess pretty soon yeah and you know thank you guys for having me it was my pleasure and i was i i was very lucky to be able to to have the career i had and to work with all the great people um and and even the other side i've met a lot of really interesting people yeah. and guys that have really succeeded and you know if you're around long enough that's what we really want to see people succeed, um, especially the guys that 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 didn't have a, a real fair shot at life, you know, and guys that grew up in the audio. Um, but there are a lot of guys that made it and I'm, I'm really proud of them. And that's what I'm most thankful for and most proud of in my career is being able to to give some people another chance. People that deserved it, though. With that said, Steve, what Lupa says, crazy how technology has connected us after the storm. <laughs> you know, and I mean, we right now we got the prison guard. We got Matilde out of, I think, Oklahoma. 
or uh, uh, watching us. We got people from all over watching this show. And you know what? This has brought us together. Brother, thank you very much. I can't wait to see you at this conference in Vegas. I know you're going to be there. And uh, please give my respect to your family and your loved ones, brother. We'll see you hopefully back in the show pretty soon. All right. I love thank you, you Steve. I love you, Dave. Uh, several people say they love you too. Uh, take it easy, Steve. Thank you. God bless you. Take it easy, brother. All right. Guys, what a show, huh? I knew it was going to be like this. You know what? We've been on for an hour and 17 minutes. And you know what? To me, literally, it feels like it's been seven minutes. I mean, it went by so fast, you know? John, what do you think? No, I mean, this is impressive. Like I said, I told him, you know, this yeah. this was great, you know, just, you know, getting that all the pieces of the puzzles actually now fell in place on my side. I mean, you always wonder what happened on the, on the Tijuana side, hearing it from somebody that actually worked it and was there mm -hmm. uh, during the time. I mean, because we had our own little battles going on here in, here in Calexico, Mexicali. Uh, that AFO, man, that was, they, they were some, they are some dangerous guys. I mean, I know that some of these guys are longer in the business, but family's still doing stuff. Oh and, yeah. And, Without know, a doubt. Know, so, yeah. yeah. I mean, you can't just, Stop doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's these guys. Uh, it's even worse now, I think, because if the if the females are running it, I, I'd be more scared of the females than the than the males. These males are well, too macho. And, 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 and Edina, like to... Edina, the sisters, one of the main ones. Yeah. So and, yeah, I, he's yeah. one of the main ones. I, I'd be more afraid of her than than yeah. them because I mean they know how to. They have that poker face and they don't like to, you know, they'll hit you where it hurts, man. Yeah. Benny, with that said, tell us about our next guest next week, and we're going to be calling it a night. Well, we got uh, Brian Perry coming back to join us. Uh, he's going to be covering extremist groups that operate within the California Department of Corrections. You know, I, you know, Steve was a member and supervised the CDC group known as SSU. So we're going to be talking about all these groups that actually infiltrate the California Department of Corrections that are active. They're there, and we're back there. Uh, we're active back in the 70s, you know, uh, California Department of Corrections established the Special Services Unit, which is an essential part of the department's violence control program. SSU is a police unit within the Department of Corrections. SSU is structured to work better and communicate with law enforcement with the law enforcement community with us. The Special Services Unit conducts major criminal investigations and criminal apprehension efforts of prison escapees and parolees wanted for serious and violent felonies, just to name a few. Hey, uh, Lupe, we're working on getting Manny Lopez. We got a, several calls into him. Hopefully, we'll get him in the near future. With that said, uh, Chalo, hey, any hey, word? Hey, hey, so, Benny, you, you mentioned about the you know, extremists. That said maybe we should go after the politicians. Oops, I'm sorry. I didn't say that. No. Uh, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> anyways man like i always said integrity th means everything i mean doing the right thing um even though you know might not be the most popular thing to do but if you do the right thing all the time uh you come out shining at the end integrity benny as always you know for those that are working that blue line putting their lives at risk prepare for the fight of your life man fight dirty get tough and mean train and know your job don't be caught on some asshole cell phone where they're trying to make you look like you don't know what you're doing. And sometimes you don't know what you're doing. So you got to know the job guy. Don't make, don't embarrass yourself and don't embarrass the department and don't hesitate. Remember the hesitation kills stay in the fight and survive. And remember experience comes from all of us, from all our mistakes. Always remember live a purpose driven life. You know what? No matter how old or how young you are, you can make a difference. You're never too old or too young to volunteer. Yes, you may you may have been you may have been a cop for 10, 20 years. You're retired. You don't know what to do. Remember, it's better to give than to receive. And with that said, live every day of your life, whether you're 20 years old or whether you're 80 years old, like it's the last day on earth. And with that said, thank you. God bless you. Have a great week. We will see you next week. Yo soy Tecato, Topi, Pato. I've got a nombre, but they call me Crazy Gato. No estoy aquí para hacerle un homenaje a la carga. Home so clávate el raje y tripeate. Cause I'm gonna take you on a viaje.
It's raining cats and dogs outside. Thunder booms throughout the night. Lightning strikes, rain keeps pouring. I'm all wet, but I'm out there scoring. Listen to that conecta holler. Me está cagando el palo, cause I'm short one dollar. Le tiro un verbo, cause I got long mac. Tell him a story, fake a heart attack, pero me tira loco. Le importa poco, me subo a la carrucha por poquito y hasta choco mojado, malías. Bien aguitado, no tengo tiempo para esta clase de tapado, so like a good dope I come back with my Mexican Express and my homeboy Jack, yo soy de gato. Yo soy de gato. Mike got nines on the run, straight for Rolly with a gun. Gotta look over his shoulder from the gate day one. His Lucas on dope, flipping out on coke. His son is doing time and it ain't no joke. I'm robbing everybody and stealing everything. Cause when I'm on a roll, hoes, you better not even wait. I'm like an eagle in a cage, trapped there for days by the power of Borrito or a package of Target. Eso te cato. Yo soy tecato. Yo soy tecato. I'm losing touch with reality. My ruka's tripping out on the change in me. I can't keep a date. I'm always late. I don't shave, shower. I never even change. I make plans, but they all fall through. Try to be pill and even hit the juice. Lost the girl that I love so bad. Cause the monkey's on my back. Now I'm alone and sad. Yo soy tecato. I beg and I borrow, rob and I steal. South go pay the face that look real. I'm a mastermind and making deals. You will really feel, wanna buy some wheels? Every day is the same old game. 24-7, I stalk the lane. When they hear these rappers, they run and hide. Cause I'm a vicious snake and I'm the king of night. You're so tecato. You're so tecato. You're so tecato. You're so tecato. I never thought there'd ever come a time when I would let drugs overtake my mind. Lost my job, my family's trust. If I don't make a change, I'm gonna bite the dust. I wanna die in peace. Hey, not in pieces. Don't wanna die of AIDS and diseases. Listen, Holmes, the moral of the story is that in drugs there is no glory, just pain. Just pain, Holmes. What are the Lord? Sufrimiento. See the familia being torn apart. The hippos crying out from a broken heart. Pongas en lucha, homes. Be smart. If you haven't started using drugs, don't start. So, como la ves? La vida está muy loca. Y también el sound. Como la ves? Hey, homes. Things gotta get better, homes. Pero así la vida que estamos llevando. Estamos gachos, so como la ves, little one. Hey, we gotta stop, homes. Sabes que gato. You're right, homes. Say no to drugs. You're gonna end up arrastrando la cobija. Hey, gato. Remember the homeboy just got released out of Donovan, homes? But in a pine box. Yeah, I heard about that, homes. Que gacho, homes. El gato se tiró un overdose, homes.